Good evening. Uh, this is the fourth webinar in our series, our spring series of webinars for the Newton Conservators. My name is Barbara Bates, and I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's event. And Nissa Patton will be taking any technical issues and handling those as our technical director. Now, some of you are longtime members, and some of you are new to the Newton Conservators. So I just want to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we were established in 1961, so we're 60 years old this year. This is our anniversary year. Uh, and we work to preserve and maintain open space in Newton. If you want to get more information about us, you can go to our, work, our, our website, which is newtonconservators.org. And we hope that while you're there, you'll join us. You'll become a member. And if you do become a member as a new member's gift, you get our walking trails guide. And this is a pretty nifty little gift because it has the history and the features and the trails for 34 different open spaces in Newton. That will be your welcome gift for joining us. With that business out of the way, let's turn to the important part of the evening, which is Beth Wilkinson telling us more about the importance of pollinators and how to attract them to your yard. Beth became a master gardener in 2003 and then earned a field botany certificate from the Native Plant Trust, in addition to helping to preserve publicly owned areas like Webster Woods, where native plants and their pollinators can flourish, Beth enjoys working to attract pollinators to her own garden. She's a board member of and the walks coordinator for Newton Conservators, as well as being a member of both the Newton Parks, Recreation and Culture Commission and the Newton Tree Commission. She's also the person who organizes and presents all these webinars. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, for doing that. So welcome, Beth. Welcome, everyone. It's really nice to be here together, even though we can't all see one another. It's as close as we're getting for right now. Uh, we owe the richness and beauty of our environment to pollinators and also much of the food we eat. Three-fourths of the world's flowering plants and about 35% of the world's food crops depend on animal pollinators to reproduce. We'll explore how to attract to plant to attract pollinators, and I hope that you'll agree that gardening for them is a lot of fun too. Uh, starting out with three photos of pollinators from my own garden. There's a bumblebee on an Asclepius tuberosa. There's a great black dagger wasp on a milkweed, a swamp milkweed, and there's a wonderful black swallowtail uh, caterpillar uh, climbing up a root plant. We will see a lot more of pollinators. This is a corner of one of my pollinator gardens uh, a few years ago. It looks a little different than this now, but you still have a lot of milkweed there. Uh, the early conservators webinars this season were marked by absolutely amazing, really exhibition quality photos. Most of the photos in this webinar are a lot more modest, modest. Unless otherwise marked, all the plant photos were taken by me, usually just for my own documentation purposes over the years. Uh, my intent is to demonstrate that dealing with the for planting with pollinators is a really accessible task that all of us can take on. So let's start now by doing a quick pollinator review before we get, in, get to plans for your garden. What is pollination? Okay, pollination is the act of taking transferring pollen grains from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma in order to produce seed and create future generations of the plant. Each grain of pollen that comes in delivers two sperm into the ovary by way of the pollen tube. One sperm enters the female egg in order to produce the seed, and the other one unites with two nuclei to develop into the endosperm, and that's the nutrient that provides tissue to surround the seed. The great majority of flowers are pollinated by animals, usually insects. These animals, especially the insects, provide an ability that plants do not have, at least not in any major way. It gives mobility. And pollination occurs as the unintended consequence of an animal's activity as it moves from flower to flower, usually sipping, sipping nectar, nectar 
Uh, and as it's doing that, the pollen grains attach themselves to the insect's body. And nectar is the reward that insects get for working for the flowers. It takes a lot of energy for a plant to put on flowers. And the whole expense of those showy flowers and the alluring ascent is to bring in the predators. This is a wonderful plant. Let's see if I can get my right here. This is a bloodroot, a photo taken by Mary Holland, who's a wonderful Vermont naturalist and blogger of the bloodroot when it's first blooming. And this on the right is a bloodroot in my garden a few days after it first bloomed. And you'll see there are no more petals out. Once it's done, once they've served their purpose and the pollination has been done, this is the most dramatic example, but in general, they don't bother to maintain that anymore. It's too great an expense. There are over 100,000 species of pollinators on the planet. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife estimates that it may be as many as 200,000. Although, as I said, the majority are insects, some of them are really surprising, like this really beautiful black lemur uh, who've been found dipping into the flowers of the traveler's palm and also other trees in order to extract the nectar or pushing their snouts way into the flower to drink from the nectar chambers. They, uh, the flowers are wrapped in leaves that are really strong to spread apart. So clearly there's been co-evolution. They're made to be pollinated by these black lemurs. Another surprising pollinator is this Cape Rock Sengi. It's a smaller South African mammal that has a taste for nectar. Uh, and it also burrows its nose in rock crevices to find plants and become pollinated. These are wonderful examples, but they are not what we have here in Massachusetts. We have much more mundane pollinators. In order of importance, our pollinators are bees and wasps, butterflies and moths, hummingbirds, flies, mosquitoes, beetles, ants, and slugs. There are no bats that are pollinators in Massachusetts, and the dragonflies and damselflies that are so beautiful that we see flitting around, they are not pollin pollinators. Uh, they both eat, they're both predators that eat lots of insects and they keep our life around our gardens while we're working in our gardens a lot more pleasant, but they're not pollinators themselves. Let's look at our pollinators a little more quickly. First of all, our most efficient pollinators are bees and wasps. Bees far more than wasps. They fit into four categories. They're social bees, solitary bees, social wasps, and solitary wasps. All of the bees but the honeybee are native. Native bees 70% nest in the ground and 30% nest in cavities like in trees. Uh, if people get very worried if they plant for pollinators. Are they going to have to, are they at greater risk of getting bee stings? The bees really, unless you disturb them greatly, you're not going to be stung by them. Have a little more worry about the, the social wasps because they are the aggressive ones, the paper wasps in the yellow jackets. But what we see mainly are bees and they are really quite friendly folks to have in your garden. People usually think about the plight of honeybees, but often they're not aware about the plight of our native bees, which are really essential to pollinate many of our native plants. There are 11 species of native bees listed on Beecology, which is a wonderful app you can get for your computer uh, by Robert Jagir, who's a real bee expert at UMass Amherst. And uh, of them, three, are radically endangered, and they're really at risk of being extirpated from the state in the next decade, should current trends continue. They face several dangers. They face the danger of to toxic pesticides and herbicides, of loss of habitat, like all of our pollinators, change in bloom time caused by climate change. They've, all of the bloom times and the times the pollinators come have meshed and become intertwined over the years. If suddenly the blooms are coming earlier or later, they aren't there when they need to be, when the bees need them. There's a lot of use. Uh, there's a declining number of native plants on which they depend, and there's competition from honeybees. 
uh, which is a, a difficult topic. Uh, but the bumblebee experts believe that the existence of non-native honeybees negatively affects the future of our bumblebees. Robert Chagir says, if your focus is on biodiversity, then honeybees are not part of the equation. Putting honeybees in your backyard is not helping biodiversity and conservation. If that's your goal, then you're not achieving that goal. On to a cheerier view. There are more than 100 species of butterflies and moths. It's the second best pollinator in New England. Uh, these are a few of my favorites. I'll talk a little bit more about them later. Uh, but as friend of Cold Spring Park, President Alan, Alan Nogi points out in his recent letter to the editor in the Newton tab, more than 40 of these 100 species of butterfly are listed as species of conservation concern in our state. That means they're at risk. That's one of the reasons why it's really important for us to plant for them and to help preserve them. This is a spring azure butterfly. It's one of the earliest butterflies out. We'll talk more about it later. This is the ever popular monarch butterfly. We'll talk about it in milkweed. These two are my absolute favorites, the Eastern black swallowtail. The male is primarily yellow with its markings and the female in blue. Uh, there are a lot of them around Newton. The great spangled fritillary moth and the beautiful, wonderful, looks almost like a hummingbird, snowberry clearwing moth. There are so many more, but I can feature only a few of them. Uh, hummingbirds are the only bird pollinator in Massachusetts, and we have only one species of hummingbird, the roomy-throated hummingbird. They can weigh as little as 2.5 grams. That's the weight of a penny. It's pretty incredible. Uh, a lot of people like to put out hummingbird nectar in feeders. The actual nectar is a much better food source for hummingbirds than that fake nectar that goes in the feeders. Uh, it's also hard because those feeders, they say, need to be cleaned out every two or three days to avoid bacteria building up. It's much better if you put out the plants that they'll want to eat, and that's better for the plants too because if they get used to eating nectar, from the feeders, then they're not going to do their job helping the plants and it's going to hurt the environment all the way around. And then we have our less efficient pollinators, the flies, the beetles, the mosquitoes, the ants, and the slugs. A lot of people are surprised that mosquitoes are pollinators. Yes, those miserable buzzing creatures do some good for us. So next time, uh, they do so much more bad, but yes, at least we can give them a small vote of thanks. I'm sure you were uh, aware in 2017 when the really shocking study came out about insect apocalypse uh, that in some reasons, some regions of Germany, there was over 75% loss of insects. Some follow-up studies have revealed that, that many of the most dramatic losses are in specific regions rather than being worldwide and universal, but there is no question that the situation is really dire. Entomologist Doug Tallamy's reaction is to say, insects are the foundation of biodiversity. They aerate soils, they pollinate plants and remove dung and cadavers. If they disappear, entire landscapes will change. Given these risks, do we wait to have definitive evidence that species are, are disappearing before we do something? The answer, I think, is no. I don't know if everyone knows who Doug Tallamy is. He's a pretty amazing guy right now, uh, very active. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, and he's authored three books. About 10 years ago, Bringing Nature Home came out, and it was a revolution. It was amazing, amazing to read, and Newton conservators were very fortunate that in 2011, he came to talk at the 50th anniversary meeting. Since then, he's published Nature's Best Hope, which presents a lot of related material to what we're talking tonight. And then his very recent book is Nature of Oaks, and it talks about how important oaks are in the environment. And that's a wonderful whole webinar topic on its own. So that's why we care what Doug Tellamy thinks. And he says what we need to do, what he proposes to save pollinators in our ecosystem, is to start a new movement that he calls homegrown national park. 
Uh, he says that we don't have enough habitat throughout our whole country, so we need to start making mini habitats, our own habitats. He asks individual homeowners, property owners, land managers, farmers, and anyone with some soil to plant in to start a new habitat by planting native plants and removing most invasive plants. That's his call to action, and I hope we can all answer it together. So now we get down to the nuts and bolts of this. How do you start thinking about planting a pollinator garden to deal with the issues we've reviewed so far? Uh, Doug Tallamy says, first of all, aim for 70% native plants. That's what you need in your garden to support a population of, of pollinators. You don't need 100%. Uh, we all have some non-natives that we love. I debated about putting some photos of mine in and then I thought, nope, that's not the topic of this. We need to talk about why it's important to have that 70% be native plants. The benefits that Talamy lays out is that compared to native landscapes, yards that are dominated by introduced plants, by non-native plants, produced 75% fewer caterpillars, were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees, the nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs, the clutches were 29% less likely to survive, nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and maturation was delayed by 1.5 days. I find that pretty persuasive. Most people don't realize how few native plants are in most gardens and yards. When, when I go walking my dogs, I play a game with myself. I look at the, the well-tended, beautiful uh, gardens around me and I do a quick survey. How many plants in that yard are native? These are two very tidy, well taken care of yards near me and there is nothing for the pollinators to eat in that yard. Uh, hope they're not on tonight, <laughs> but they are beautiful yards. They just don't have anything for pollinators to, to feed them and sustain them. So how do you start transforming a property like this into one that will support pollinators? First thing you need to do is to choose a location. It can be part of an already existing bed you can dig it out of lawn, which does nothing for the environment anyway. Uh, you can take a, a, an area that already has plants in it and you can intermix your new pollinator plants with it. How big does it have to be? A bed as small as three or four feet square is great. Uh, the photo on the left here is one that Doug Tallamy used in a talk. It's very cute, looks like it's on the berm. Uh, the one on the right is a small pollinator garden that I put in last year, the year before. And so however small or large you want to start, you have to choose the size and choose where it's going to be. Then you have to start considering which native plants you're going to plant. There are four steps that I recommend. You look at how much sun your pollinator bed will get. Then you look, figure out how dry or wet your soil is. Those two things you can do just by inspection. When you're checking the sun, I recommend that you do it at different times during the day so that you get a sense of overall how many hours of sun or no hours of sun you get. You also need to think about what you need to do to have flowers all season. And why is that important? because they're pollinators all season. And if you have all your flowers in the spring, first of all, your garden isn't pretty all year long. But more than that, there's nothing for the pollinators to eat during the other times of the year. And you need to think a little bit, well, it's good if you think a little bit about what pollinators you would especially like to attract to your yard. I am really proud that we have a new source to answer all four of those questions. Uh, Mark Feldhusen and I developed a toolkit as part of the pollinator working group that was established by councilor, city councilor Alicia Bowman. And we came, we, we assembled a lot of material and then Newton North senior Veer Gododia implemented on the Newton Conservators website with some help from his younger sister Dia. Many, many thanks to both of them. Veer is going to be a freshman at MIT next year, and we're incredibly grateful that he donated his time for this project. So you can see in this that on the left, they're the Latin name and the common name of plants. Uh, 
then after the height, you can find out when the bloom time is. So I'm showing you the beginning of the section from mostly sunny gardens. Uh, there are charts, and this is only part of that chart, but there are charts for mostly sunny, partly sunny, part shade, and all shade. Uh, we started out with 15 plants in each category, and we also have shrubs, trees, and vines in separate sections. So in addition to other information, these charts are invaluable. You'll see that there are sections that show you what pollinators are attracted and what soil type the plant likes best. I hope that's going to be helpful. Uh, if when you click on the name of each plant, a photo pops up. So you get some idea of what it looks like. I will talk more about the toolkit later on, but please uh, explore it on your own. Uh, the other thing I want to say is this guidance is really good. It's very important. Oh, I'm playing games here. My cursor doesn't want to go where it's supposed to go. Uh, but what I recommend uh, most of all is that you experiment and have fun because plants don't read tool books. So something that says it's for a mainly sunny garden might do absolutely wonderfully in a part sun, part shade garden have some fun and experiment. I wanna take us on a uh, quick tour through what blooms when during the year in Newton. Spring, in the very beginning of spring, spring, trees are amongst the earliest to bloom. Most of those very early trees are wind pollinated. You can see by their dangling structure that they are perfectly set up for the wind to blow right by and carry the pollen to another flower. Pollinators will visit them and they will provide food for, for pollinators, but they're not necessary for their reproduction. Uh, the tree on the left is one of my favorite. It's a little understory tree. It's Acer Pennsylvanica, the striped maple. It's a gorgeous tree. If you have a little shady spot, it doesn't get very big. So you could actually put it in a medium sized pollinator garden. The one on the right is an ironwood or an American hornbeam, and it gets, it's still an understory tree, but it gets to be a little bit larger. It's, this is the year, right? We've all been on webinars. Uh, I went to a wonderful Grow Native webinar uh, by a woman named Rebecca McMacken, who's the director of horticulture for the really, really impressive Brooklyn Bridge Park. And she referred to spring as the time of the meadow in the sky. That is just such a perfect name because that's what happens in the early spring. We have a meadow in the sky. All of these trees were blooming within some in my yard, some within a one block area of my yard this spring. It is a time when pollinators, there's not as much blooming on the ground and pollinators can get many meals by being up in the sky. We do have spring pollinator plants on the ground though. The first plow flowers of spring, you'll notice, are often open and cup-shaped because they are not specialists. They want to get whoever is, is around at that time of year and they want to get pollinated. Summer is when the pollinator garden really comes to life. The variety and number of pollinators increases greatly during the summer. Here's a beautiful array of a cardinal flower, a common evening primrose beneath it, a swamp milkweed with a honeybee in it, an anemone virginiana, a prickly pear, which I'm gonna talk more about in a minute, a geranium, the, the sort of pinky purple is a geranium maculatum, and then there's lupin on the right. And they are just, it's a glorious time in the garden. This is the one I would take a little break to talk about one of my favorites. Uh, this is New England's only native cactus. And you can see it's really popular with the bees. There are two bees in it and that's not an uncommon sight. But it is a gorgeous plant. It is a great pollinator plant. It, it likes full sun. It blooms in June. Uh, it's also visited by ants, wasps, beetles, butterflies, and moths. So as long as I've stopped to look at one, save, favorite, one summer favorite, uh, let's look at another one too. This, thanks to my neighbor, Sarah Solomon, who took photos while I was away. This is a video. 
and you see the little hummingbird going around, that's at a cardinal flower. And then it will go over to the culver's root on the left and then some wild bergamot. Uh, if you plant it, they really will, they really will come. Let's go back to other plants of summer. Uh, during the summer, shrubs are a really important feature, uh, especially in the early summer. Viburnums are one of my favorite. I have four types of viburnum in my yard. They are beautiful, they're hardy, they don't take a lot of care. Um, seeing all the white flowers here might make you wonder, uh, why, why so much white? What, how does that attract insects? Uh, bees in particular uh, don't see the way we do. They can't see red, but they can see blue and green, and more importantly, they can see ultraviolet. So a lot of these colors look different to them, and there are markings on the plant that we can't see. Uh, and those markings and, and other features are called the pollinator syndrome. It's a fascinating topic. I recommend doing some reading on it, or maybe someone will talk about it another time. We have to keep moving through the seasons now, though. Uh, the abundance of summer eventually gives way to the plants of fall, which have their own beauty. Uh, here we have a New York ironweed. We have rudbeckia. We have wonderful white turtlehead, bottle gentian, goldenrod. I won't go through them all. Uh, there, it's just it also is a delightful time in the garden. So at this point, we've talked about your location, your sun exposure, having something in bloom all season, so you can go through, have some one of these plants going at all times. And then it's time to think about what pollinators you're interested in attracting. Pollinators and plants evolved together and they changed in response to one another. It's, it's a bit of a war. Uh, the insect comes, the pollinator comes to the plant and it says, no, I need to protect myself from you. And it makes changes and then the insect changes and together they end up uh, meeting where we are today. And this is another favorite of mine, a fall favorite, the bottle gentian. And you'll see on the left, there are the closed flowers. The neat thing about bottle gentian is they never open. That, that's the full extent that, that the flower is going to open. And you can see the tips are not very white. They're quite purple. And then the bumblebee comes around. You can see in the second photo, that was the bumblebee uh, flying above it. I was so fortunate for years, I wanted to get a photo of this. And I just, last summer, I just happened to be walking by at the right time when this big bumblebee uh, pushed his way into the flower. And these are specialists uh, on this flower because very few of the pollinators are strong enough to push their way in and get to the pollen inside. And you can see once the bees pushed its way in, the tips become kind of white. So it's fun if you plant this plant to keep an eye on it. Uh, there, are, there are specialists in plants. In addition to that, many of the pollinators have their own host plants. Host plants are the nurseries of the garden. Female pollinators lay their eggs on the plants, which then feed and support the young larvae. Only specific plants work for some pollinators. The white chelone, the white turtle head that you see on the left is pollinated by bumblebee bees and visited by butterflies and ruby-throated hummingbirds as well. But the caterpillars of the Baltimore checker spot butterflies have that as their host plant. The, litter, the leaves are really bitter and they're not usually palatable to deer and rabbits. We'll talk more about that a little bit later but that makes that a good plant for the garden. On the right is the azure, the spring azure, and it's, I've shown it with some of its host plants. Uh, sometimes they have only one host plant, sometimes pollinators have more. Uh, that's a dogwood tree, it's a mountain mint, and it is a uh, red twig dogwood, is the one in the lower left corner. So it's fun to try to match what you could like to have more on by figuring out host plants. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Native Plant Trust. It used to be the New England Wildflower Society and it changed its name about two years ago. And they have absolutely, besides selling great plants, uh, they have really good material available 
site. And these lists they have uh, show not only the color and bloom time and sun, uh, but they also show the larval hosts. So uh, I can send out these links in a message that will come out after if people, you don't have to worry about copy them, copying them all down now. I can send you a list of links. If you want to get into the weeds a little more deeply, uh, it would be really good for bees if you were to choose not only some host plants, but if you were also to choose pollen sources and nectar sources. Uh, pollen is what bees gather. They use it for protein. Uh, I don't remember the exact figures, but uh, the, pro the protein count of pollen can be up to something like 75% and the average hamburgers 25%. So it's a really powerhouse source and they bring it back and feed it to their young. It's, it's especially important when it, early in the year. <coughs> so I recommend having a pollen source if you can, as well as nectar sources, which is what most plants offer to pollinators. Uh, there is a link at the bottom to the Jagir uh, Beecology uh, app and it presents a list there of the plant lists that you can have for both pollen sources and nectar sources. Where to buy all these plants once you've decided what you should get? We're very fortunate to have two organizations that sell plants every year. Grow Native uh, has a plant sale. Uh, you can, members are able to go in and pick them up. Last year we had to do an, an order. This year it's an open sale. And Native Plant Trust at Garden in the Woods. There are three great local nurseries that carry a lot of native plants, Garden in the Woods again, Russell's Garden Center, and Weston Nurseries. And there are three mail order nurseries, there are a lot more, but there are three, the Prairie Moon Nursery, and actually Prairie Nursery are ones where I've been very happy with the plants I've gotten. And for seed, Ernst Seed and Wild Seed Project of Portland, Maine are really good sources. Okay. You've picked out your plants, you figured out where to buy them, you've gotten them, and now it's time to get your hands dirty. So there are a few things to think about when you're going to get your hands dirty. First two go together. Try not to work the soil when it's really wet and don't disturb the soil more than necessary to dig in plants. When this, these are both to preserve the soil structure, which is really important for getting nutrition to the roots. When I was in my master gardener training class, they used to say, okay, you dig up the whole area, uh, you really uh, work in mulch, you work in compost, no. Uh, you want to dig as little as you have to to comfortably get the roots in. Allow space to grow around each plant. It's not as beautiful the first year or maybe even the second year, but it's what the plants need to be healthy. And don't amend the soil in the hole you dig for each plant. What happens if you amend it, you have the absolute perfect spot right there for the plant to grow, but then its roots don't wanna go out from that spot into the less rich soil. So it's good for you to keep the soil right around the plant, the same that you want the roots to grow out into. Use mulch sparingly. Uh, mulch is good because it will help keep moisture but you don't want too much and you especially want to leave some bare dirt somewhere around your pollinator garden. Because remember I said 70% of those native bees dwell in the ground, they have to dig into that ground somewhere and there's getting to be less and less and that's part of the habitat that's disappearing for the pollinators. And the first season, if you, if you plant native plants, the good thing is that they are made for this environment. So in general, they don't need a lot of watering. However, until their roots get established, you do need to water really regularly. One more tip uh, that people haven't thought of much before, but it's getting to be more and more known. Minimize the yard, the light in your yard at night. When the sun goes down, that's when moths and beetles and other nocturnal insects that spread pollen between plants go to work. But the research revealed that these creatures might be at risk from artificial lighting, which they find even more alluring than the nectar in the plants and pollination doesn't get done. 
If lights interrupt nighttime pollinators, that could lead to less fruit and fewer plants. And it's a change that could ripple through to the daytime pollinator populations as well. There also is speculation that nighttime light could affect the circadian rhythm of plants. Yes, they have them too. And having light at the wrong time that they're not used to can cause problems. We need lights for security, right? With some of the problems in Newton, uh, it's been recommended to have more lights on. One solution is motion activated lights. They can provide security at the same time they help pollinators by not being on all the time at night. A little more about the actual planting, the actual getting your hands dirty. Uh, I wanna show you a few of my favorite tools, which aren't the usual shovels and spades uh, that, you, that you might think of. This is my all time favorite tool. If I could have only one tool in my garden, it would be this hori hori digging knife. And hori is Japanese for to dig. Uh, it's strong, it digs well. The serrated edge held on one side helps to cut through roots. And it's really great for cutting off the layer of matted roots that's usually at the bottom of a new plant when you get it out of a pot. Second most common tools are my pruners. And you'll notice, first you'll notice the blades. I keep my tools outside. I'm a low must, low fuss gardener and I wanna have my tools there. So I'm sorry, they don't look pristine and beautiful uh, like you sometimes see in gardening blogs, but, but these work for me. Uh, the ones on the left are bigger ones. They're Felco. I also have some Coronas that I use. I use them, I've got a somewhat arthritic and not great hands. So I use those bigger ones only for when I'm cutting uh, twigs off shrubs, when I have something that, you know, uh, half an inch or so or greater to cut. Most of the time I use those little drams, which I buy on Amazon. Uh, they're only between six and seven inches long. They do almost all the work that needs to be done and they're, they're really easier on hands. I think they're, they're absolutely terrific. Also, if you have smaller hands, they're great for those. And this is a new addition to my set of tools that I've fallen in love in with, and it's a hoe and cultivator hand tiller. Uh, I rarely use a, sh a shovel because I don't have great shoulders and I, that leverage is hard, but this digs all the holes. I dig big shrubs in absolutely wonderfully with this. So once you've done the digging and there are, the plants are all in, that, that's not it for pollinators. There's still more that you need to do. All creatures need water, but don't leave standing water, please. Still water attracts mosquitoes to lay their eggs. And in August, that could lead to more West Nile disease, which harms people and birds. I've used the big bowl on the right for years. And I replace that little uh, bamboo fountain you can see. Every few years, it tends to wear out and I put it back in and you can see a bird there. You can't see the water trickling down very well, but the water keeps going wonderfully and the birds adore it. And the problem with standing water is, uh, for especially for some reason in my yard, well, uh, uh, corvids are the blue jays, crows are much more susceptible to West Nile than other birds. And one year, a few years ago, we lost 11 blue jays in our yard. We have a lot of blue jays that hang out here. They, they like the berries, they like the insects, they think it's great. This is one of the blue jays that we lost last year when it was first getting sick with West Nile. So please provide water, but if, oh, I also have some, some uh, round uh, stones with indentations in it that I keep water in. And insects have a little easier time going into that, but I make sure to change the water every time I water my garden. So it never stands more than a day or two. Some of the need nators can be surprising. Uh, for years, I looked at Sphinx uh, moths at Garden in the Woods. And I used to tease that I was going to capture one and bring it home because I really, two actually, because I really wanted them in my garden and I hoped they would show up. And I imagined I'd see them fluttering around a beautiful flower. And I finally saw one. And uh, I think you can see it there. It's the big one. It's fluttering around with the flies. And uh, nope, it's not on 
it's not on a flower it's on some poop that my dog one of my dogs had just put down uh, many butterflies will take nourishment from fresh feces as they draw in moisture they also get minerals i'm not recommending that you keep it around i'm just saying that uh pollinators have incredibly varied needs plants uh, i'm sure all have been seeing garlic mustard around this year and lesser celandine. Uh, invasive plants come from overseas without their own native pests that keep them in control. And without that, they're healthier and they tend to crowd out our native plants. The leaves stay longer, which gives them a survival advantage. Catherine Howard of Newton Conservators, who's the treasurer and leader of the invasive plant removal team and her crew do a lot to control native plants in Newton's parks and conservation areas, but we're on our own. Please tend for that. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the, the fight that goes on between milkweed and black swallowwort to the disadvantage of uh, monarchs. Uh, they're both in the same family. And milkweed is the host plant for monarchs and they don't know how to tell the difference. So they lay their eggs on black swallowwort, the larvae hatch, there's nothing for them to eat on the black swallowwort and they die as if the monarchs did have enough trouble. Uh, you can see the pods that hang down about midsummer, and then they come open up and become those little dry leathery pieces later in the season. So if you see that, remove it. It can be hard to dig up. I did a good job. There's something called carbohydrate, carbohydrate starvation. And as long as you keep the green out so that none of the sugars can go down to the roots, if you do that for a few years in the row, you can get the plants to go away. I got a pretty big patch in my backyard to disappear that way. Uh, in your garden, signs of nibbling on your plants can indicate success. It says you brought the pollinators. On the left is a black swallowtail caterpillar and on the right is a monarch butterfly caterpillar. I was gonna talk a little bit about them, but we're gonna scoot right on. Uh, some of the, the bugs you find nibbling may be invasive and cause more harm. Uh, here's one that showed up. I told you I love viburnums. Here's my cranberry viburnum two, three years ago. And you can see how the leaves were absolutely chewed to pieces. And there's the beetle in the middle. And good news is nature often takes care of things and finds a balance. And it did. And there's the same shrub at the end of last year. So you can hope for that. That's not always what happens. Uh, uh, biological control for some real pests has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, there was a winter moth. I don't know if you've noticed that we used to have tons of them. Uh, by about 2005, it was spreading really fast. And in parts of New England, trillions of winter moths wreaked havocs on oaks, maples, birches, and apple trees, and many blueberry bushes. And Joseph Elkinton, a professor at UMass Amherst, worked with other entomologists and they found this little parasitic fly. And the fly lays its eggs on a leaf, the caterpillar eats it, the eggs hatch inside the caterpillar and they consume it. And we have no more, we have very few winter moths. Uh, they haven't disappeared, but they're in a good balance. That is a wonderful thing. It doesn't always work. So the question is, what do you do? Please don't use toxic chemicals on or near your pollinator garden because those pesticides and herbicides that will kill the unwanted weeds and the insect pests are gonna kill your pollinators too. And some people seem to have a misunderstanding. Organic does not mean non-toxic. It's equally poisonous. Some plants themselves can be toxic and I feel the need uh, to issue a little warning about that. Uh, I got very uh, lax with what I put in my backyard uh, because I had old dogs who didn't chew a lot. These are my two-year-old babies now. And when they came in the backyard, I went, oh no, because they ate everything. Uh, if you're going to have dogs around your pollinator bed, I suggest you look them up. There's a wonderful list at the bottom of this page that the ASPCA Laurel in particular and swamp eddy milkweed uh, are really poisonous to animals, are really toxic. So if, if dogs are going to be running around, do a little research. Now, it's not toxic, but a lot of gardeners I know think these little wonderful furry rabbits are, is, they're toxic to the garden because they can eat, they can eat so much. 
So what are solutions to protect your new pollinator plants? Uh, you can use an edging that they like more. They clover, uh, they really like, and it provides all the nutrients they need. Uh, that's one possibility. You could consider a fence. It's a little hard to see, but there is chicken wire all around this pollinator garden. Though I have a picture a friend sent me of, that I couldn't find to share with you, of a rabbit sitting right in the middle of a wired off garden. Rabbit resistant plants are often promoted and Grow Native has a great section uh, with a link here. And I can again, send it out uh, with rabbit resistant plants. Uh, I have found that a hungry rabbit will eat almost anything. So you could choose my method, which is I just plant extra and share. But I know, I know, Catherine, if you're listening, I know that's not, not everyone's approach. Uh, sometimes you want to know what other plants are, what other creatures are investigating your plants. There are lots of that. Some people really like seek. I haven't tried it. Um, I'm a naturalist and it's free and there are experienced people who validate your choice. It's $30 to buy, but it does a really good job of identifying plants to just plants. So all too soon after you've uh, established your garden, you've chosen your plants, you have it planted, uh, you've protected it, uh, the end of the season comes. And so what do we need to do? Uh, you want to make your garden equally uh, inviting to pollinators during the winter. As the little sign at the top says, that's the name of an organization in Europe, nature isn't neat. It's neat, but it's not tidy. Uh, so leave seed heads in place for late season food. Leave hollow stems in the fall because there are many bees that hide in it, in the stems, especially of plants like bee ball. So you want to leave things for them to, to bury themselves in, including leaf litter. And you don't want to clean up in the spring until it's been above 50 degrees for five days. The single best option, the sign says it, leave the leaves. Leaves are not litter. They're food and shelter for butterflies, beetles, bees, moths, and more. Tell friends and neighbors to just leave the leaves or at least not complain about your leaving the leaves. Uh, I want to remind you again about this toolkit that now is on the Newton Conservators website. Uh, it contains the charts I mentioned. It contains more planting advices, references. End of next week, there's going to be a new edition coming soon. A demonstration pollinator garden at City Hall. Mark Feldhusen and I, the two who created the toolkit, received permission from the mayor's office and the Parks, Rec, and Culture Department as well as a planting grant from Newton Conservators to create a demonstration pollinator garden at City Hall, just on your left as you turn into City Hall from Homer Street. Planting is scheduled to begin this weekend and you can see what we're doing as you start to work on your own pollinator gardens, we can work together and there will be updates posted on the Newton Conservators Facebook page. My final word of advice is experiment and have fun. You can feel good that whatever you do will leave nature and pollinators in better shape than before. So please enjoy. Thank you so much, Beth. That was just terrific. Absolutely terrific. So Beth, we have a ton of questions and uh, some of them you've sort of touched on, but uh, many of them you haven't. One of them asked you to speak a little bit about black swallowwort which she can see all over the place. And my question uh, to you is, you said, go ahead and dig it up, but is there anything else that people can do if they're pressed for time? Yes, they can take the pods off. Most important thing is to not let those pods open and they're in the milkweed family, they have white fluff, just like the common milkweed you see all over. So if you have time to do nothing else, just get those pods off and plant milkweed near them. Uh, the two interns, Iris and Bennett, were removing some black swallowwort from a pocket park 
along Crystal Lake where there is both uh, common milkweed, a lot of common milkweed and a lot of black swallowwort. And they were there for several hours and looked at what the monarchs were doing there. And they found that when given the choice of two, now clearly this is just you know one, one example, but they found that the monarchs tended to go much more to the milkweed. So remove the pods and get some milkweed in both. Okie doke. Uh, the next one is about milkweed and it says, I planted a milkweed root that a neighbor gave me about three years ago. It spread and I have about eight or nine plants coming up now, but they never flowered, nor have they gone to seed. I know the caterpillar larva needs the leaves, but I'm wondering why they haven't flowered. They tend to love sun. Uh, so my question to the person is, are the plants in the sun? Although mine do quite well in part shade as well. It's very hard to answer without seeing it. Um, are the leaves, I have a question, are the, do the leaves look okay? I have had a fungus on some of my milkweed uh, plants uh, that's caused them to be stunted. Um, I don't know. Uh, you, the, uh, you can contact me at walks at newtonconservators.org if you want to have more of an ongoing discussion and show me a picture. I'm, I'm happy to chat. While you're talking about sun and part shade, is there some way to know what is part shade, what is full sun? Does full sun mean no shade at all from sun up to sundown, or does it mean four hours or more of shade? Yeah, it means four um, to six hours ish, and it's full sun. Okay. But as I said, I also find the plants can be pretty forgiving, and I play with mine. I also, if they're not happy in one place, uh, there's some that put down long tap roots and don't move well, but my plants move around. And if I find they're not happy in a particular spot, I'll take them to another spot. Okay, we have one. And milkweed, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I find that milkweed moves quite easily. Hmm. Okay, now here's another question about the plants that are good for pollinators. Are there also plants that are good for pollinators and good for birds? For example, with berries that birds like, are the are, and it goes on. Are any of these good in shade? This person is very interested in shade plants. Wow. Um, understory shrubs and trees are great uh, to get some ideas. Um, bear, just in general, for trees and berries. Uh, Amelanchier trees, which can grow, they're multi-stemmed and they, they grow in a very shrubby way. They are one of the best trees for berries. Um, mine, uh, from the moment they start blooming, the birds are in them. I have a wonderful video of some robins going wild. Uh, Amelanchier is the service berry or shad bush. Is that the common name? Yes, it Great. is. Thank you. Okay, then there is a question about the pollen and the nectar. Are they replenished? Or once a pollinator visits, are, is the pollen and the nectar gone forever? There is replenishment that's done. Uh, it's done only, they keep replenishing it only as long as, only until pollination actually fully takes place. So just because the pollinator is, comes in and sips, it doesn't mean that that particular plant is going to, uh, to be pollinated. So somehow they, they know and they keep replenishing it, but it's a slow process. Okay, we have somebody making a comment here. It says, uh, it's from Alice, and Alice Ingerson, and she says, from another dog owner who'd love to give her whole backyard over to native plants, our river birches roots have already put an end to the lawn, which we don't miss, A, how do you protect your large newly planted areas from dogs while still letting them play in the yard? And B, how do you deal with the ticks that might enjoy large or rarely mown areas of native plants? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, don't, I don't have ticks. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate. I know that's not true for everyone. I think you have to deal with ticks from the dog end. Uh, either that or get chickens or get, encourage possums. Oh, possums love to eat. 
Yes, the opossum does eat ticks, um, so uh, that's a good way to vacuum them up. Uh, it, it is very hard to deal with ticks from the garden end. Uh, it, I think you have to deal with it more, unfortunately, from the dog end, which, which does mean uh, giving, them, giving them chemicals. I'm sorry to say, you can get chickens. Uh, chickens will eat the ticks. You can encourage possums in your yard. Possums will eat the ticks. Uh, I'm fortunate I don't have a tick problem, uh, but I, I know lots of people do. Ticks, to my experience, tend to be in a more grassy area. Uh, I don't have much grass. Uh, and, and asking about what you do for uh, dogs, uh, putting plants in with dogs, uh, Alice, come on over and see my backyard. <laughs> it's, a lot of it is hard packed with shrubs and trees. And I, I don't try to put a lot back there. Uh, I think putting fencing around it is the, is the best thing. Uh, with luck, it can be temporary. And once it's established, you can remove it, but it has to be pretty, I, I don't know how big your dog is, but it has to be pretty sturdy. Okay, we have a question from uh, Carol uh, Hausner, who is saying, I've been planting native plant perennials for several years. Sometimes ones that have done well for years suddenly cease to come back. Is this normal? And she's citing uh, Annis Hyssop in particular. Yes. Uh, so at some point, plants go away. Uh, it depends on how they, how they reproduce, uh, whether they spread by rhizomes. The rhizomous ones tend to uh, just keep going on forever. Uh, it also depends on your, your conditions changing. Uh, something that's been full sun, if your trees grow larger and shade an area too much, uh, that can make the plant not come back. It's tough. I was just looking at photos of my garden from 10 and 15 years ago, and I thought, oh my goodness, I don't recognize the place uh, because there is turnover. Some of it is, is non-native plants that I've, been, that I've pulled out, but some of it is just lifespan of plants. And although it's unfortunate for money, consider it an opportunity <laughs> and, uh, and try something different. Somebody is asking, Barbara Epstein is asking, can we plant these balconies? I live in an apartment. That's an interesting uh, article uh, for us to put together is which of these grow well in pots. Um, I have pots, I, I uh, fill in in my garden, pot up some plants, we'll stick that pot in the area and then, or if it's, if it's too early for the plants in that particular area to bloom, and I'll move it around during the year. So yes, many of these plants do well in pots. Okay. Well, you're getting a lot of praise here, the saying excellent information, thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of our participants saying, I know that poison ivy is native, but it's not user-friendly to me. <laughs> is there an appropriate way to eradicate the loathsome P.I. <laughs> uh, the loathsome P.I. is native, but you know, the Newton Parks and Rec Department has a rule that anything that's, uh, that's in the area where people go, poison ivy isn't welcome there. Um, it's a problem. Uh, certainly there, there are two kinds of poison ivy. Some grow up trees, one kind grows up trees, another kind is flat on the lawn. Uh, I was just walking through a, a conservation area the other day and I found myself uh, holding onto a tree and then I looked and I thought, oh no, that's all, those are all poison ivy vines uh, coming up. Uh, there, you know, Eric Olson, who's doing the next webinar we have, has a belief that if you, if you root paint plants and you do it in the fall when the roots are, uh, when it, they're shutting down, that using a little bit of herbicide is okay on plants like that that are really uh, either very toxic or very uh, persistent. Uh, that's a possibility. That's good to know. Uh, again, you're getting more comments about this is absolutely outstanding. Uh, we have one other question that says I'm, uh, that is actually offering information. It's not a question. She's uh, saying, somebody is saying, I'm taking a course with Native Plant Trust and they list bats as pollinators of plants 
which are closed during the day. And then she recommends going to pollinator.org. We also have a question coming in uh, that says, my backyard is covered with Asian Pachysandra and Lily of the Valley. I don't know what Asian Pachysandra is. Uh, and what is the best way to get rid of it? And can you suggest a good native ground cover to replace it? Uh, I am playing around with wild strawberry. Uh, and uh, I'm also, uh, it, though it, it, they don't last extremely long, uh, I am putting some may apples in an area that has been very covered with lily of the valley. And I have been digging and pulling it out for more than 20 years. And it is so persistent and it's so awful. Uh, if you're willing to put the area uh, out of commission, you can put down cardboard and put plastic over it for a period of time. But even then it just, the, the rhizomes just, rhizomes just spread everywhere. Uh, I work on a combination of digging when I have the energy and I carbos, carbohydrate starve it. And little by little, I'm, I'm winning the fight, but it's a long, hard fight. That's one reason not to allow those plants to get established uh, as you're fighting the ones that already are established. I just saw on Newton Next Door the other week, someone advertising giving away Lily of the Valley and people wanting to come get it. And it was just all I could do not to write, no. Uh, but I thought, no, that was their <laughs> space, not my space. But agreed. Uh, again, you're getting lots of praise. This is wonderful. I wish everyone would plant meadows in their yards. Thank you. So I think that's the end of our questions, Beth. Do you have anything else that you would like to add? No, I don't. Other than uh, I hope everyone has a great time. Oh, I lied. I have one question for you, my own question. What does slugs pollinate? Oh, uh, slugs will pollinate wild ginger. Oh, of course. So that's one of those weird plants that has those, uh, yeah, those pollinating mechanisms that are a little bizarre. One last question then for you. You had said no standing water, but what about putting a little bit of larvicide in the standing water where you have your bird bath? Do that. Okay, I do do that. Good, and it works. It works fine for me, but uh, it's not poisoning the birds, it's just poisoning the mosquitoes in that little bit of water, not everywhere. <laughs> well, with, not, with that done then, what I'm going to do is say good night to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>